Okay. Thank you very much for being here today, and welcome everyone. Uh, before we start to deep dive into the, today's topic, I would like to tell you a little story. Nico, engineering manager at a top tech company here in Spain, he had a meeting uh, next day with uh, with um, senior management team. So we pre-booked a taxi with free now, and he pre-booked it to 6 a.m. next day, so he could catch his flight. However, when he, when he left home and was waiting for the cab, he realized that the taxi driver canceled him. He kept trying to get a new taxi driver, but the, the application was just crashing and crashing, and uh, it couldn't do anything. At the end of the day, he could grab a taxi, but it was already too late for him. He missed his flight. At the same time, person, people from the engineering team on Freenow, they were wake up um, with a pager, and after debugging some couple of minutes, they realized that the, the voucher service, the service, the service that provides uh, discounts in, in our application, it was down. Next day, the data team, they, they ran some data, and they realized that uh, during the, the outage, the company had lost 100K euros. And this is the story that I would like to, to start today, to, to set the, the ground. Um, this is what inspired me to talk about resiliency for, for microservices and distributed systems. It can be your e-hailing application, it can be your e-commerce shop on Black Friday, uh, it can be anything, it can be more or less critical. In this case, one person missed his flight, uh, in your case, it can be something more critical, uh, life and death situations, or just losing revenue uh, for your company. A bit uh, story about me. I'm, a, I'm João. I'm Portuguese. I'm a software engineer. I've been a software engineer for five years now. Most of my career have been in, have taken place in, in, in Barcelona, Spain. I love distributed systems. And I work for Freenow, uh, formerly known as MyTaxi. And I, I serve there as a tech lead slash engineering manager, which means that in more or less two years, I won't be able to talk about technical things anymore. <laughs> and just to, um, to warm up a bit, uh, how many of you run microservices in production? Okay, quite a few, most of you. How many of you run more than 300 microservices in production? Okay, almost, almost no one. So this is the, the, the ecosystem uh, uh, wh where we live in. Um, we are three tech hubs, um, Berlin, Barcelona, and, and Hamburg. And we run more than 300 microservices, most of them uh, they are in the JVM. So this talk is mostly focused on the tools uh, regarding the JVM, but they can be extrapolated to anything that you are uh, running in your, in your company. And the thing about microservices for us was that, um, okay, it, it was um, a really good, good technology, but for us it was more about scaling the teams to make the teams be able to work independently from each other and, and to make sure that we weren't um, stepping on each other's toes. And people ask you, why does an e-hailing application such as MyTaxi have more than 300 microservices? What the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, and the thing is that whenever you, you hail uh, a taxi, there's lots of things happening um, uh, behind the scenes vouchers, uh, calculation of the distance to, to your driver, um, and discounts, many, many, many things that, that are happening. And they can fail at any time. But the question that we should ask ourselves is, are all of these services that important? If some of them fail, 
would my customer be affected? Because my customer, mainly they, they want to go from A to B. Why an outage in, in the voucher service has an impact on that? And that leads to another question, which is, could we operate a partial failure? Could we still get something, uh, get the, the app running while other services fail? And that's uh, where resilience um, comes into place. And resilience um, is the ability to, to recover from, from um, it can be an illness in a human being, can be something that it recovers uh, its original shape. So in distributed systems, resilience uh, mainly has um, three parts where, where it's focused. Graceful degradation, which means that you put in place a fallback or a cached response uh, or something like that. Automatic recovery means that you shouldn't deploy anything new in order to fix the, the partial outage. And the lowest user impact as possible, meaning that if there's a tiny feature that um, is failing, it shouldn't uh, just render the, the whole screen um, black or white. And then the, the next question that, that arise is like, what should we do? in order to be resilient. Should we just retry a request? Should we just hide the feature? Provide a static fallback? Provide a cached response? Fall back into another provider? Just fail fast and uh, assume that the, the, um, the customer can't do anything at that moment because it's so critical what's failing that it makes no sense to, um, for the, the user flow to, to continue. And the answer for this? It's not, it's not clear, and the, the best, the best um, advice that I can give is for you to sit down with your business people and ask them, okay, what is really, really, really the core of our business? What, what's, what uh, if it fails, it, we, we start to lose a um, massive amount of money or we start not providing value to, to our customer? And for sure, they will say everything. <laughs> you, you ask to one department, yeah, it's the pricing service. You ask the other department, no, it's the, the ETA to the, um, to the driver so the user knows um, how much time they have between um, uh, being picked up or not. And therefore, uh, the, my advice is to try to compare. Like, okay, I know that this is important for you, but if this fails, but the, option, the other option is no service at all. And then people start to realize that there are trade-offs involved and they, they start to, to, ch to change this, this mindset. And as a, as a case study, I uh, wanted to present, um, I wanted to present this. So every time that we, we show a, an offer to, to, our, to our drivers to pick up a passenger, we show usual information, distance, blah, blah, blah. But we also have some mechanisms to incentivize uh, drivers to, to pick up a passenger. Why? Because sometimes there's more demand than supply. Therefore, uh, every time that we request a tour, we also have one thing called incentive service, which provides this uh, green, uh, green uh, card here, saying, hey, if you take this trip, I'll pay you two euros tops, uh, at top of the, the journey. The thing is, is, this is important, right? But it's not critical. We could still move passengers from A to B if this doesn't work. So usually, the, um, the first response that, that, that we have um, when dealing with such uh, situations of one of the downstream services failing is, OK, we should just retry the call. Retry the call, and, and that's it. And we have here a very nice example. Uh, of a retry, and with this, we, it's solved, right? We fix the problem, everything's fine, we are making money, everything's good. But it isn't. <laughs> um, and it isn't because we were just retrying uh, the call indefinitely, and in this case, if the, the, the service that runs the, the incentives, uh, it was uh, just failing uh, constantly, we were not giving it um, room to breathe, and therefore 
uh, we were just um, putting more pressure uh, into this downstream service instead of backing off and saying, hey, let you recover. And when you recover, I'll start, I'll start to, um, to ask you again for, for incentives. OK, fair enough. We know that retrying indefinitely is not good. So we, we evolve the, this, and we make it uh, with a maximum amount of, uh, of attempt. And this is much better, right? We retry three times. If we can get anything back, uh, we just return the, the offer to the driver without any incentive. So now, now we are good. So for, before we weren't, but now we can make sure that the driver uh, can still see the offer. But that is not true. <laughs> because even if we uh, just repeat the, the, the call three, five times, the number uh, of retries that we, we consider, it may create this wave of retries because we, we, we are a service that operates at scale, many thousands or millions of requests per second. So every 10 milliseconds, every 30 milliseconds, we are just creating a new wave of requests and not giving this um, room to, to the downstream service to, to breathe. And then there, there are more iterations on this, on this retry thing. Uh, and then people start to think, okay, Maybe just the, the amount of retries is not enough. We need to put some um, exponential back off in the, in the retry. So people start retrying the request every 10 milliseconds, then 20 milliseconds, then 50 milliseconds, and stuff like that. But even that is not enough. Because uh, as, uh, as we saw with the, with the retries, even with the exponential back off, with many, many requests per second, it's highly, um, it's likely that some of the retries will be just on time also because uh, there are many requests. So every 10 milliseconds, every 30 milliseconds, and every 50 milliseconds, you will have this wave of things uh, just calling the downstream service. So okay, the, the, um, my pro tips on the, on the retry pattern is just we limit the retries per request. Uh, don't retry uh, indefinitely. Then use a randomized jitter uh, together with, uh, with exponential backoff. Therefore, uh, you, you avoid this uh, synchronicity of um, many requests being um, backed off. Separate retriable from non-retriable operations. Uh, for instance, if you receive a for HTTP 400 bad request, maybe your request is bad formative, so it makes no sense to, to retry it again. So make, making this distinction also alleviates this, the, this problem. Another solution um, with its pros and cons will also be to uh, use a queue mechanism such as Amazon SQS or, or RabbitMQ or something alike with, each, um, with other pros and other cons. OK. And as I said, I mostly work in the, in the JVM. So uh, in the JVM, we have uh, Spring Retry, which really helps us uh, to make uh, things right from the, the beginning. We don't need to write our own uh, retryer. Um, we have one that already comes with all these uh, nuances, like exponential backoff, uh, randomized jitter, all these kind of things. And the great thing about a Spring Retry is that it provides also a method uh, whenever we, expi we, we, we end up with, uh, with the uh, attempts, we can just log or just send an alert or whatever we, we, we feel it's right for, for, for our service. If you don't like annotations, uh, Spring Retry also allows you to define a retry template that then you can use with a higher function um, to do exactly the same. So resilience, right? It's all about retries. We got it. We just need to retry all the calls. But there's one thing that should be taken into account. Idempotence. And idempotence is just a fancy word um, to say that if you try to do 
two operations, uh, two, the same operation twice, it will have the, the same result. And a couple of months ago, we, have, we had this problem in production. We shipped a nice feature called uh, On The Way, where drivers could get tours wha while they were on the way to, ho to their homes, optimizing their, um, their usage of the, the taxi uh, itself. So we defined a REST API, and we said, OK, we create a resource for the, this on the way trip. And then when the driver gets home, we delete this resource with a RESTful API. Everything is great. And someone decided, OK, if we delete the, this resource at the end, if the deletion is OK, we, we just handle a, a 200 or a 204 or whatever. And if the, um, this, uh, this resource doesn't exist, we throw a 404. Makes sense, right? 404 doesn't exist. Makes sense. The problem was that the client wasn't expecting a 404 to be also considered a success. So everything that was not a 200 was treated as an error, and some drivers, they got stuck in the application, and they couldn't do anything. And this, this might be, you might think, OK, this is kind of, kind of trivial, and it's kind of small issue. But the thing is, if we don't think about these kind of things, um, bad things happen, like a driver cannot work for eight hours, he is losing his revenue. Um, or if we, we try to, to, um, to consume a REST API, for instance, for, for payments, and this API is not idempotent, we may end up charging our client twice or thrice because we didn't realize that the, the API was not idempotent. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk here if the REST API should return 200 and 404 or always 200. I'm not going to debate that. And I'm not also talking about uh, its importance as a whole here. But just make sure that uh, whenever you consider retrying operations, you take its importance into account. OK. Retries are fine. We need to think about different use cases. And now I want to talk about graceful degradation, right? Um, the example here is uh, the same that we've been talking until now. Uh, so we have uh, an app which has a dispatch service, which dispatches a, a tour to a driver, and also an incentive service to, to give these uh, prizes to drivers or whatever. And what we want is that if the, the downstream service, in this case incentive, is not working, then we can still uh, ruin our app. Otherwise, we will ruin the experience for, for passengers and drivers. And in this case, this would mean something like this. So ideal scenario, we show the bonus. Not ideal scenario, graceful degradation, we don't show the bonus. OK, makes sense. But how to achieve this in a, in a, in a real application? And way, the way we achieve this is using the, the circuit break pattern. And the circuit brake pattern is, uh, it works more or less like a real circuit breaker with a, with a small nuance, which is every time that a, re a request to a downstream service is successful, the, cir the circuit is closed, everything is, is OK. If many calls during a short amount of time fail, so the, the circuit opens. And every now and then, it will try another call to the service to see if the service, downstream service is already healthy or not. So it, open, it keeps it open or it closes the circuit um, up, um, depending on this. And in the JVM, one of the most used alternatives is Netflix Istrix. It's a library created by, by Netflix like seven years ago or something like that. And it allows us to make our, our applications more fault tolerant and um, latency aware. It allows for graceful error handling and uh, fallback, and it, it exports lots of metrics, and we will see later why this point is quite key. However, like I said, was, this was seven years ago. Many, many things happened in the, in the tech world and in the microservices world. And um, Netflix is being superseded by Resilience4j, 
uh, which has, has a more uh, functional approach and has basically support. Netflix is not supported anymore, so if you encounter a bug, no one will fix it for you. Also, if you work in other stacks uh, like .NET or, or anything alike, you could uh, run other things like Poly and other kind of technologies that just do this same uh, circuit breaking approach. And using Istrix is quite easy. Uh, you just need to extend the Istrix command class and implement the, the run method. Uh, they also have uh, a non-blocking alternative, which is Istrix observable command, but the, 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 the rest is, is quite similar. And one thing that's key in these kind of things and key in the way we operate Istrix uh, are these two lines here. Um, we define what Istrix calls a common group and a common key, which is basically like the downstream service we are consuming and the operation we are consuming in these services could be uh, create incentive or get incentive or get last 10 incentives, these kind of things. And we will see later why this, together with the metrics that Istrix exports, is key for us. Also, to implement fallbacks is really easy. It's just to override a method in the Istrix command and you have a fallback. A fallback can be just return um, cached response, static uh, response, uh, empty, um, can be many things. And at free now, one key thing is that every service is defined by an abbreviation. So driver gateway service is DGS, incentive service is INCS, for instance. And the cool thing is that uh, all the operations that we have in the service to service communications, they are defined with this pattern, source, destination, operation. And what this allows us is to then find root causes much more easily. We use Grafana to, um, to monitor um, our systems. And in one of the dashboards that we, we have available for every service is the in incoming and outgoing latency and the amount of requests. Here, with this source destination pattern, you can have very easily, for instance, all the calls that traverse from driver gateway service to incentive service, but you will get also the, the calls that go from incentive service to another downstream service. So it's quite easy for you to grasp uh, what's the, the, the root cause of the problem. We also have distributed tracing in place, but these dashboards, they, they allow us to, to see, for instance, um, just looking at, into it, okay, is this service, it's failing completely. It's not just one operation, it's everything. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense for us. And then we, we built more things on top of this because we, we realized that this, these dashboards, they were a bit fragile because when, when people uh, start to, to use them and to, to create this source destination operation um, pattern, sometimes uh, they assume that the, the abbreviation for the service was different or they assumed or they just misspelled uh, one letter and you couldn't get this uh, graph right anymore. So we built this, uh, this uh, small library that just uh, infers what is the source um, service and you just put uh, the destination service as a type safe option here with this library and you just get um, the operation. Okay, we talked about retries and we talked about circuit breaking. But that's not all about it. There's more things. For instance, if you have uh, in a service A many calls to service B, C, and D, uh, for sure some of them are more important than others also. And we need to have a way to isolate uh, ones from the, the others, right? Because otherwise we could spend a lot of CPU and, 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 and memory and, and network um, bandwidth 
calling a lot one of the services that it's not critical, and then the, um, the resources will be exhausted for the services that are really critical. And uh, the ship industry, they, they solved this a long time ago, um, because w whenever they, the, um, the, the ships they, they, they got water into, they, they, they wanted to, um, to create some isolation between, between the parts, so if one of the parts uh, got flooded, not the whole uh, ship uh, would get flooded, so it would not sink. And they call this bulkheads. Actually, as a, as a fun fact, uh, Titanic had bulkheads, but they weren't high enough, so that's why Titanic sunk. And in a distributed system, it would look more or less like this. So you define that uh, some workload it goes through, um, through a thread pool, and you define that other, uh, other calls will go through others, and you can limit this. So you can say just, OK, I just want maximum 1K requests uh, per second to, the, to my, my, my service B. And this is also really useful because you may, with this amount of requests, you may also get, get into trouble the, the your downstream service. You can cause cascading failure without knowing. And this would prevent something like someone forgot and he did um, an HTTP call inside a for loop and something went wrong, the for loop is infinite or something, and this would save uh, your day. And again, Histrix, they, it provides already all the tools that we need um, to, to do this, this isolation, this bulk heading. Uh, you can use uh, a thread pool, or you can use a, um, a, a semaphore. Uh, usually, usually the, the main difference is like um, with, a, with a thread pool, you get more isolation because it's a, new, it's, um, a different thread uh, where, where the call runs. Uh, with a semaphore, it runs in the same thread, uh, which means that you can run more concurrent uh, calls to the downstream service but it also runs in the, the same thread where you, you call the, um, the downstream service, which means that you can potentially also create problems uh, in your service. Usually, the way Histrix is configured is to do isolation via thread pool. If you have lots and lots and lots of, of calls to your downstream service, maybe you can consider to use semaphore. Another funny story that we had was like a couple of months ago, I think. One of our services, it provided statistics. Uh, it got an upgrade on a Thursday, um, a minor version of PostgreSQL or something. And the next day, we realized that the, um, something was really wrong. The, some queries were taking a lot of time. Uh, all that we could see was right. We didn't touch the service. The, the indexes were OK. Um, we were not actually sure about what's going, what was going on. And the service was just keep getting 500. We had circuit breaker in place, so it was not a uh, big issue. But we knew that the service was failing, and we, we knew that we would need to take time to, to, to get it back healthy again. So. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could just ignore some HTTP calls to a downstream service and not even uh, trying to, to reach it at all? And this is, was exactly what we did. And we apply what's called uh, load shedding. Um, we just said, OK, for this particular comment, don't try to get statistics. It's not important for us if the driver doesn't get the statistics now. He won't complain, but please open the circuit and uh, don't try to, to call um, driver statistics service. And then we could have the time to recover it and make sure we, it, it was working properly and then disable this again. This was just changing a configuration. No deploy, no redeploy uh, was involved. Friday, we could do it. OK, so we talked. Retries, circuit breaker, bulk heading, and load chatting. And we talked a lot about healthiness. 
healthiness of our surfaces. And another thing that we should take into to account when, when we talk about distributed systems is to, to make sure that our systems are healthy. They, they, they can achieve their, their purpose. Usually what people do, they create a slash health uh, hand, endpoint in their services and it is called the health uh, endpoint um, pattern. Fortunately, in, uh, J in the JVM world and for Spring applications, there's already a Spring uh, act health actuator um, that you can just use uh, out of the box and you can even configure and tune to your own needs. And it's quite, quite easy to, to do it. Um, for instance, if, if you have a payment service that highly depends on Stripe, you could just check, okay, is Stripe working? If Stripe is not working, your service is not working. So you could just um, apply this kind of logic. Be aware of this kind of pattern because some people, they, they just think, okay, so my service depends on service A, B, C, and D. So uh, I will just call all A, B, C, and D uh, to get the, the health of, of them. And then A, B, C, and D, they will do the same. And, and this causes a, a cascade of, of, of calls. Make sure that you just um, create this uh, health endpoint based on the things that you control. So your own database, your own cache, your, your uh, third party provider, if that's um, a condition sine qua non to, to, for us, your service to, to operate. So, retries, circuit breaker, bulkhead, load shedding, and healthiness uh, endpoints. As a, as a um, small summary of what we, we talked here today, we talked about distributed systems and how they fail. We can't rely really on distributed systems. They fail all the time for a uh, lot of reasons. Network fails. Um, new services are deployed in container bug, etc. And if failure is the constant, just embrace it. We can retry. We can do as many retries uh, as we want, as, as long as they are uh, containers, so it's a limited number. But carefully. Be careful about idempotence. Be careful about uh, exponential um, backups without uh, jitter and how these things can bite you uh, in the near future. And resilience. Resilience is a, a really great safety net, right? It, it allows us to, to make sure that our services, even though they may fail a bit, they will, they will still recover and they will still serve our users. But don't fall into the trap that in this safety net will, will save you. Find the root causes of your problems if something is happening too often. Make sure that you monitor it properly and that you can get um, observability in your service that allows you to pinpoint what is the, um, the, the, the piece of the puzzle that's creating a problem and then fix it properly. And then resilience at free now. What, what were the, the benefits of implementing all these things? What were the benefits of um, putting time to, to teach the teams, hey, you can't just uh, retry indefinitely. Hey, you really need to, to fine tune um, your, your workload here because maybe this, this part of the system is not as important as this one that you are, that you are also doing. And the first thing that comes into my mind is that we, we had way less fires. And we can, we can work in a much better way. Because the first, the first thing that people um, say back to you when you say, hey, a distributed system is not reliable, people say, yeah, but this will fail like 0.1% of the times. And then you make the math and you say, yeah, but 0.1% of the times, times millions of requests, means thousands of failures. If this is an important API, you may get thousands of tickets saying, hey, this customer didn't get 
this thing, you are not paying your drivers, you are not applying this come to your users, and then you, you start this snowball of bug fixing, bug hunting, um, this kind of thing. So better be prepared to fail than, um, it, because it allows us to, to have less fires. It also allowed uh, our people, our engineers that are on call to sleep better at night. And this is quite key for us. Uh, we, we want to provide really good um, work-life balance. And if things just fail every now and then, um, people will just get alarm fatigue and then they, they won't look into the alarms anymore uh, and it gets, gets messy. And as I said, um, it's, yeah, we built some tools, we built some things around uh, resilience in our company, but it's a cultural thing. If people know that their service will fail, they will prepare much better um, their services for, for, for the future. And they, they will, will start asking questions um, way before. They will ask their product owner, okay, and how, how many, how many um, times do you, you think this feature will be served a day? And they can start to say, okay, this will be quite problematic if we don't scale it properly or if we don't put some measures into place and these kind of things. And the last one, uh, as I said, Netflix Hystrix is good, is great, we use it, um, but unsupported at the moment. So we need to look into the future and we don't actually know what's the future for us. Maybe we will embrace Resilience 4J or maybe we can uh, rely on um, service mesh like uh, Istio because we already run our workload in, in Kubernetes. Uh, but then there are trade-offs uh, because if you rely on, uh, on Istio and a service mesh, who defines this, uh, these thresholds for timeouts? Who defines these kind of things that with, with Hystrix, they are contained in the application. If we move it to the infrastructure layer, maybe people think that the platform team should be the responsible for it when it should be more like a service owner responsibility. So we are uh, still evaluating what, what are the, um, the trade-offs here. And um, yeah, this is all from my side. I, um, I'm happy to chat with you afterwards about resilience and I'm happy to, to take any question that you have. If you are shy to ask a question in English, uh, you can ask a question in Spanish and I will just translate it and, and answer you. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? No questions. Was well, that bad? <laughs> okay. Okay. I take one. <laughs> Hi. Nice session here. Thank you. Uh, just one question about the bulk heading. Uh, how is history working with that? I mean, if you said that ROM, for example, in, you said that it's only handling 10 requests per, per minute or per second, and your load in production is a lot bigger, how is it dealing with that? Everything is stuck in there, or it's everything timing out? Okay. I don't know. Okay. Uh, if you use um, the, the, the threat pool isolation, it just gets... Um, uh, reje rejected uh, thread exception, and it, it just uh, doesn't pass there. Okay. Anything else? Okay. If you want to talk afterwards, I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you.